All right, testing, testing, are we live? We are live. This is a room where you had switchboards. You had switchboard operators that were communicating through some form of code. And that code was Morse code. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mr. T. I'm gonna give you a quick little synopsis as much as I can about the history of the radio medium. As you can see here, the radio medium was initially intended to be a interpersonal medium. It wasn't necessarily designed to be a mass medium as we hear today. But as you can see, there's a room full of operators that are switching channels to and from, from sender to receiver. They're sort of the medium part of this. And in a nutshell, what we end up studying with these switchboard operators is that they actually dated other switchboard operators during this time. So the first uh, texting was through this code. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about the birth of electronic media and the transmission of music and talk, which is also what we know as the birth of radio, popular radio radio and the origins of broadcasting. Most of this content, if not all of it, is inspired by your textbook and also a text that is noted here by Tom Standage, who is the editor of The Economist. And if you don't know of The Economist, check it out. But he has a book that's entitled Writing on the Wall, Social Media in the First 2000 Years. And it discusses primarily those findings that there were people that actually built relationships with one another through this telegraph. And that's the origins of broadcasting. If we think about the first electronic medium that changed how we communicate because it sped up communication in a nutshell, it is the telegraph wire. And so what we end up finding in this particular unit is that the telegraph which was invented by Samuel Morse in 1844, it allowed for our messages to be sent electronically. So they didn't have to be carried uh, from place to place. So no longer does the transmission uh, set limits of our communication. So as we consider that, it's important to note that the telegraph was the precursor of radio technology. So before we start thinking about AM and FM signals, we really have to consider that this all began with the telegraph wire and the laying of the transatlantic telegraph and the Atlantic telegraph, as you can see on here. This was the precursor and this is what was necessary. As we learn in mass communication, technology is going to build uh, communication technology is just going to build on top of, of each other. And we're going to advance and continue to see the sophistication and modification of our technological communicative tools. So there is a series of dots here and dashes represents a system. It represents an alphabet. It represents a binary code, which we use today with the digital age. And in 1866, just to kind of build some historical context here. The first transatlantic cable is laid and it connects Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Ireland along with the eastern seaboard, seaboard of the United States. So what we're experiencing here during this time is obviously a shift in ideology, in how we can communicate, and this really rocks the boat just like we're seeing with the devices that we have in our pockets now, these, are, these were game changers. Um, this, these individuals here were uh, noted as theorizing about electromagnetic waves, as you see here, James Maxwell. And then Heinrich Hertz, which is noted as, a, he's a German physicist in 1888. He's the first to admit the elect electromagnetic wave. Um, and these were significant deals in order to get to uh, actually discovering and in, in, uh, manufacturing radio technology. So 
1894, you actually have uh, Giuliani Marconi, who is uh, reading about Heinz works and uh, Hertz works, excuse me. And he's concluding that we could actually uh, create some form of wireless telegraph from point to point communication using frequency waves. So through all of this discovery, we also end up having Nikola Tesla. Uh, Nikola is, is uh, declared the radio's inventor not until late 1943. There's a huge history behind Tesla and his works with regards to wireless technology and energy. So I encourage you to watch his PBS documentary that is significant to the study of radio technology. And it's too much for me to go into, so I'm gonna continue on. But I will, I will tell you that he is one of the unsung heroes when it comes to radio technology. So I encourage you to read more about Nikola Tesla. And this leads me to some regulations of the new medium. And this really is the first medium that the, we, we, we study regulation of all these mass communication tools. And ultimately this has a storyline as well. Uh, the Radio Act of 1912 is what requires licensing. It requires uh, for radio uh, broadcasters to adopt what's called the SOS distress signal which is in common day known as maybe your amber alerts or weather uh, alerts that you get on your device now. A lot of what we see today is, is the, uh, the legacy that was left behind with this act. And it's significant to point out that the World War I, uh, during this time, the Navy actually, the US Navy actually took control of the radio airwaves that were just beginning to uh, be developed for commercial use. And the corporate heads and governments were really uh, conspiring to make sure that radio uh, served the American interests and not necessarily uh, be taken over by the federal government. So uh, the Navy had taken over control of, of radio technology and uh, including patents, including patents, and, and it wanted to maintain control after the war, but the civilian government officials said, no, uh, it, it, it belongs to, in keeping with tradition of the US uh, independent media system that we have, uh, it did reject these ideas of all government control. And it was, uh, I'm sure, debated and deemed uh, unconstitutional and violated the First Amendment rights. So this is important because we also consider this uh, philosophy as we move into television and the internet. So the regulation of new media, it also continued on into the 1930s and 1940s. So as we can see here, as a response to uh, providing control to some degree back to uh, the people, right? The, the airwaves are of the people as, uh, as, as noted by many scholars. But what, what ends up happening is commercial influence begins to, to take hold here. And the Radio Corporation of America, in conjunction with the federal government, creates this what's called a consortium, right? An agreement of between four major companies. You've got General Electric, which is uh, GE there on the slide. Um, and you also have AT&T, which is huge in the, tele in the telephone uh, game at this time. Westinghouse, which is a huge uh, in energy uh, uh, provider. And there are also uh, ties to the, the uh, railroad uh, network that we have in America with the wealth that's coming from, from uh, George Westinghouse. Um, and then you also have the United Fruit Company, which is also noted in this unit as a company that was already using uh, signal, radio signal to um, push their commercial use of their boats uh, to bring back and forth the, uh, the, the fruit supply. So the Radio Corporation of America is essential to the history of radio and essential to mass communication because it, it does become a monopoly and it gives the United States um, control uh, in terms of the government control. It is more of a regulation and a partnership with commercial businesses 
and it, it, but it, what it does allow uh, is it allows for these companies to then uh, continue to progress and continue to find new ways to fund this new medium and make it a commercial medium. So as noted earlier on, um, when you look at the legacy of newspapers and the telegraph and even the telephone, which is an interpersonal uh, communication tool, um, you also have those legacies investing into this new technology. And you also start to see remnants of the television industry, which is to come a little bit later, later on. Uh, what, you, what you first see is the first broadcast companies and NBC is what is created out of this consortium in 1926. And the shared sort of conglomeration, if you will, between these companies allows for NBC to develop two major nationwide networks. Uh, they, they, uh, the original telephone group uh, became known as NBC Red. So you have an, a red network owned by NBC. And then you also have uh, NBC Blue, which through uh, the, the incorporation of antitrust laws, you have uh, debates between, you know, is RCA, RCA uh, controlling too much? What ends up happening in a nutshell is NBC Blue actually ends up um, being forced to sell off and it actually later on becomes the American Broadcast Company. So here you have the birth of the big, the big three. And so CBS, um, the, the uh, Columbia Broadcast uh, Service is a, is a competitor at this time. And so that's how you end up with, with the three that we currently have uh, today. Uh, in addition to the Fox network. So as you can see, there's more and more regulation here. Um, in 1927, there's more legislature that leads us to more ability to function with the, the radio waves because you know you now have the, the dials and this really allows for one uh, particular local station to have one part of the dial. So you know it's not like you have you know, two radio stations competing with each other on the same dial. That's what this allows for. So it allows for more, um, you know, facilitation of the technology for, uh, you know, for, for it to grow. So you could only obtain a license as long as uh, you said you're going to serve the public interest. And uh, back in this day, it was extremely important for that to be known and that's what was part of this radio act and this some of these sentiments we still carry with us today uh, unfortunately we we see more of a hyper commercial bias and rather uh, a company working for the public interest uh, as many uh, critics would would cite and so you have what's developed out of this is what's essential here the the uh, federal communications commission and it's, a, it, it's followed up by Communications Act of 1934, which oversees licenses, negotiation, channel problems of the radio waves, and eventually becomes pretty significant in the television game as well. Moving on into the authority of radio, um, from a social cultural point of view, you have the War of the Worlds broadcast, which oftentimes is noted by historians as uh, one of the biggest hoax uh, that was on radio. And it was broadcast by Orson Welles, who is also a, uh, you know, an important figure in mass communication study, in that he gives his first broadcast of what's considered to be a sort of misinformation uh, these days or, or a fake radio um, broadcast. And it, in, in these, these are moments, right, that happen in our, in our history that then require the FCC to step in. We'll be looking at another one with television, but it's what prompts the FCC to call for stricter guidelines uh, and for uh, disclaimers and warnings before and during programs that, uh, that might be, you know, deemed as it, or meant to be uh, something that is, is just a, a made-up story and not necessarily uh, something that's true. So, uh, the golden age of radio is also discussed in this unit, and we consider that, you know, the programming really is what 
uh, drives not just the content here, but it becomes the content on television medium. And then uh, years to come later, we still see some of the same programming patterns like live music uh, daily, and then maybe some intermission with some, you know, just a brief news headlines, uh, variety shows of what were big back then, uh, quiz shows, which I still hear on NPR on Saturdays, uh, and some of the dramatic programs like soap operas. And, uh, you know, that was the programming. And we get the name soap opera from the golden age, uh, you know, because they were called short, uh, anytime, daytime targeted primarily at women. Um, and they got their name from commercials for soaps and uh, during these during the programmings here. So it's kind of interesting that it, it, it that term has has endured. But the golden age of radio really has a significant uh, point here that it, you know, radio plays the same role that television uh, maybe does today or that the Internet does today. Um, radio was the mass medium right, that served as our first point of contact in, in these, you know, 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, it was a form of entertainment in many households, and uh, that was huge. That was, a, that was a big cultural shift because what that meant was now we were receiving our information from uh, the external, right, from outside of the home rather than from within the home. And so how does this change the family dynamic? Uh, and how does it change race relations? Because we start to see content that is mass produced for a mass audience um, that can be deemed, you know, in, in, in at least in, in short today as, um, as quite racist. It's stereotypical. And, and this is uh, Amos and Andy. It's also discussed in this unit. I believe for uh, this particular course, it's going to be on page 172. And it poses the question is, when is a radio show racist? Moving on, it also emphasizes the power of radio in, during the, the, world, uh, the World War I and II periods where fascism rises in uh, Europe. And this is a depiction here of a, a protest, I'm sorry, a, a propaganda poster uh, in, uh, in Germany that you know, establishes the power of, of the uh, medium and how it uh, can influence a lot of people. So the rise of the formatting is what we still see today. We, we still see that it's uh, driven primarily by, you know, this formula, top 40. Um, and even now you've got stations that obviously are catered to a certain uh, genre. And so uh, you use heavy rotation and top 40 formats and creation of uh, program logs, logs and, and day parts. So it, it, it cuts itself up depending on the part of the day, you know, the morning show and afternoon show, etc. So uh, this is in reference to the so 1950s, where we start to see this happen more, where, um, you know, the recording, the sound recording business begins to blend and, and synergize with the radio industry to promote new artists and so forth. There's also the what's built as a legacy in the 1960s, the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 gets passed and it, it allows for the creation of national public radio. And if you're here in San Antonio, you can find it on FM 89.1. And it's the public broadcasting service. It's it, imperative to talk about this because this is one of the few radio stations that you'll find on your dial that is uh, sort of a hybrid model where it's not just dependent upon advertisers' uh, monies to run, its, uh, to run the radio uh, station, but rather it's also donors and uh, even your, uh, your taxpayer dollars uh, go to this. And then also the newest forms of, of technologies offer a variety, as we can see with any medium through the proliferation of various options, channels, thousands of podcasts out there, internet radio, and then satellite radio as well. As we consider the radio history and the evolution of radio, we also have to consider the ownership from a diverse, uh, from diversity to consolidation, where in uh, early days, you know, we considered that this was a medium that was uh, primarily designed to just talk to your 
your fellow neighbor. And, and it's interesting that truckers around this nation still use it as a interpersonal medium because it is a radio wave. It's a radio signal and uh, the CV radio still exists. So that's what's been interesting to see is that you have it as a interpersonal uh, tool in some industries. Uh, and it is always, uh, you know, consider it to look at it as a mass medium, uh, at least since the 1930s. So Telecommunications Act of 96 brings about more consolidation. It eliminates most ownership restrictions in radio uh, and it allows for iHeartMedia, which used to be known as Clear Channel to emerge and some of these other ones that are uh, listed on here. And they at one point owned over 2000 radio stations. Um, I think it's decreased a little bit just because of the holdings and the way the business of radio has gone. Uh, you know, lis listenership has decreased due to the rise of, of other options. And it uh, dominates uh, well over 50 markets and controls one third of the entire radio station, just these companies here alone. In a nutshell, what you were able to witness was a evolution of radio history and moving it from just the telegraph from point to point, right, person to person into uh, what has been, you know, evolved into a mass medium, which is still used uh, pretty heavily. I know sometimes I like to get on my phone and check out what's on my Amazon music and plug it up to my car, but sometimes I'm just in a rush. And so I still rely uh, somewhat on the AM FM radio signal. And it's still pretty relevant in today's world because it also gives us an insight into how the television business begins to evolve and how it begins to flourish from there. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.